And this past May, there was a gentleman named Rainer Schimpf who was snorkeling off the coast of South Africa. He is a wildlife photographer, and he was photographing the um, he was photographing the the there was a run of some smaller fish that was running across the coastline there. And as it goes with smaller fish, there are then larger fish that follow those smaller fish. And in Rainer's unfortunate case, there was also a whale that was following along with this run. And as he was taking pictures, a dark shadow came up from under him. And with that, it would, this whale would swallow him. And this is his bottom right here. And right here are his flippers as the whale is taking him into its mouth. And there were other that were around, fortunately for him. And as he would live to tell about this, he would actually joke about his modern day Jonah experience. And Rainer would say that uh, he would actually make a joke. His son, his name is actually Jonas, ironically enough. But he came out of it okay, unscathed, amazingly, uh, few if any injuries at all. But he, he would remark about how dark it was, how um, intense of a moment it was. For him, it would only last a few seconds, but it felt like an eternity, I'm sure. And so he came out of it okay. And over the last, while this instance here, while this Jonah story lasted only a few seconds, we've been studying another Jonah story, the real Jonah story that dates back to ancient times in which there's this man named Jonah who spent three days in the belly of a great fish. And how he found himself there was because God came to him, asked him, told him really, commanded him to go to Nineveh to preach against that great city, but instead of going to Nineveh, he goes a different direction. He goes down the Joppa. He ends up on a ship heading to Tarshish. God intersects the ship with the storm. Jonah is then thrown overboard, swallowed by the great fish, and it's there that he resides for three days. And that's where chapter 2, verse 10 picks up. And then the Lord commanded the fish as it was coming upon the shoreline to vomit Jonah out onto dry land. Now, vomit is not typically something that you talk about in church, uh, certainly not with the adults. But, but I would say, though, if you ever teach middle schoolers, like this is a place to go to. If you feel like your lesson's not connecting, just head to Jonah chapter 2, verse 10, and you will get their attention to a word study of vomit. promise you they'll never forget that lesson. But in Jonah's case, though, he was vomited out. And we don't often talk about this in general, just because it's nasty, it's, uh, it's gross. I mean, who wants to talk about somebody throwing up whatever it is that they've eaten? It's just not something that's very pretty. Jonah found himself in that position because he ran from God. And often that's how things work when we run from God. That when we run from the Lord or we know someone else who runs from the Lord and whatever it is that God may be having them to do, they end up in a situation that isn't pretty. That can be a bit nasty a bit gruesome, a situation that people don't like talking about. Like, it's not pretty when you have to stand before a judge and await your sentence. It's not pretty when greedy family members are fighting for an inheritance or before somebody passes away, maybe they're jockeying to try to get a better position in the will. It's not pretty when a couple is going through a divorce. It's not pretty when someone else is recovering from marital unfaithfulness. It's not pretty when someone is drifting from the church in their faith. I have a friend of mine. Our sons are in the same first grade class. And through the course of us just dropping our kids off and picking them up at the same time, him and I have struck up a relationship. It was this time last year, though, that he discovered his wife had been having an affair Quickly, she filed for a divorce. They separated after 15 years of marriage, a couple of kids. It's not pretty. And he still is struggling with the anger and the rage that as a result of them splitting up, I asked him recently, I knew that she had moved on. I said, have you started to date or anything or even tried to see anybody or even open to that idea? And he said, no way. I'm still trying to wrap my mind around the fact that I'm single again and we're not married. It's not pretty when you don't, Follow the way that God is calling you to go when you don't go the direction that he wants you to go in. And so what what truth should we hang on to when we experience that personally? When we say something that we shouldn't say or do something that we shouldn't do, when we go down one of these paths, or maybe it's another path that you're on, or there's somebody in our life who's maybe going down that path, who is making decisions that you know they're going to regret. It's sort of that, that you're standing off and you're just watching this car crash 
getting ready to take place and you know it's going to happen. You wish that they would go a different direction, that they would take a different path, but you're just seeing this thing happen in slow motion. What is it that you can communicate to them as they are struggling with consequences or even as they struggle with certain outcomes of their decisions that they're making or even you're making? Well, that's what Jonah chapter 3 takes us to. It helps us to have some truths from God as maybe we're trying to turn our lives around or maybe we're trying to get back on track or we're helping somebody else get back on track. And that's what Jonah does is he gets back on track. Verse one of chapter three, it says this. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. And so God's word came to Jonah once and he didn't, you know, respond the right way. We ought to give Jonah an applause though now because he's going to get back on track. You can give him a standing ovation. He's finally doing the right thing because God has given him a second chance. And the first lesson that we have to learn in regards to when we get off track or somebody else gets off track is this, is God is in the business of giving second chances. God is in the business of offering us mercy, offering us compassion when we get off track. And you have to look no further than many of the heroes of the Bible. Like this list, Abraham lied that he had a wife. He told Pharaoh, she isn't my wife, she's my sister, when in fact she was his wife. But God still used him to be a father of a chosen people. Jacob stole his brother's blessing, but God still brought the 12 tribes of Israel from him. Moses, Moses <clears throat> killed a man, but God still made him the leader of the Israelite people. David committed adultery, but God still brought Jesus from his lineage, even when as far as to say he was a man after his own heart. And of course, Peter denied Jesus three times, but God still used him as the pillar of the early church. He was a leader in the early church. There was still reconciliation that would take place there. God is in the business of giving us start overs. It's kind of like the game Contra. Does anybody remember this particular game from from the 1990s? Yes, you played Contra, some of you. A few of you, I know you're you're a little embarrassed, but I know know more of you are aware of this game. They're not owning it. I'm not a good gamer. Never been good at video games. Was always average, mediocre, even in some cases the worst gamer amongst my friends. But I was good at Contra. I was always good at this game. And do you know why I was good at this game? Because of the code, the cheat code. There was a code that if you typed it in, when the menu would come up on the screen to start the game, it would give you 30 free lives. So no matter, you could keep dying and it would just keep moving you along in the game. And eventually you could just beat the game because there was a cheat code that would help you get along. The cheat code was... Up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, B, A, select, start. That was the code. It is the world-famous, infamous cheat code of Contra. Incredible code. And God is like that. He's willing to give us these start-overs that will help us get along in life. But here's what I've also found out. As I've lived my life, watched friends live their lives, some of you live your lives, life doesn't give start overs. Life doesn't give do overs. And you don't have to go far. Again, you just talk to somebody who has a DUI or two, or maybe even three for that matter. I mean, those are things that once they're on your record, they stay there. They don't go away. And you get in, you get caught up in a system at that point that it's incredibly difficult to get out of if you ever get out of it. Or somebody who maybe crosses a line with somebody and they do something to somebody that maybe wasn't welcomed or they touched them in a way that wasn't something that was invited. They cross a line and, and no doubt they shouldn't have crossed that line and they shouldn't have done those things. And I know people, they, they've, because of that mistake, they've been on a list now for 20, 25, 30 years. They would do anything to get to go back and to change those few moments, to change those few seconds. They wish they could do it, but they can't. Because when it comes to some of these things, life doesn't give us do-overs. It doesn't. And whether it's a bankruptcy or it's a divorce or, or it's somebody who maybe has lied, lied or stolen from an employer and they lost their job and that's just something that just tracks along with them. They can't shake free of it. And life just doesn't, often it doesn't give do-overs. And I think it's a bit ironic again that many of us are so tempted to align ourselves with a world that will turn its back on us the first chance it gets. We want to align ourselves with a system that will 
in many cases, attempt to destroy us because of the mistakes that we made. And yet we will turn our backs on a God who's willing to give us start over after start over after start over. Let's say it this way. Life will never give you a do-over, but God is willing to give you countless start-overs. Countless start-overs. You could be a hundred times worse than you are right now, and you would still be no match for the mercy that God would want, wants to provide to you. That's why we have this promise in 1 John. That if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That if we just confess that there is forgiveness, that there is an opportunity for a start-over— It doesn't erase consequences. It doesn't necessarily erase some of the outcomes. But what God has promised to do is redeem those mistakes. He's promised to redeem some of those outcomes as a result of the poor decisions that we've made. And so whatever it might have been for you. And I've talked to people who have regretted having an abortion. And yet they have come alongside dozens, in some cases even hundreds of women, and helped them journey through that process of grief or even maybe come alongside of them, intercepted them before they made that decision. And it doesn't take back the decision that they made years ago, but it does redeem the decision that they made years ago. And God's working it all out for the good. And he does that. Now, in no way, shape, or form is, God's, is, this a, is this a license for us to take advantage of God's grace or God's mercy. Often, we approach sin as if it's a parking ticket. You know, you, it's aggravating, it's annoying, it's like, oh, I shouldn't have done that. They caught me, $25, $50, $75 fine. But sin isn't that way. Sin isn't a parking ticket, it's a capital offense. That it's because of sin that we have died spiritually. And that's how God views it. It's a capital offense offense. It's incredibly serious. It's heinous. It's insidious. That's what sin is. It's not a parking ticket. It's something that affects us. It affects our relationship with God. It affects others, people. It affects our world. There's always a tearing or a breaking apart where there is sin that is present. And so it's something that we should always take incredibly seriously, even though there are second chances that are available to us. And God, again, is in the business of giving second chances. And so maybe if you have come or you know someone that is struggling, come here with some, some guilt and some shame, or you know somebody else who's wrestling with that, and they're trying to get their life together, they're trying to get the mess cleaned up, you, know, you can tell them God is in the business of giving second chances. I like how Scottish minister George Morrison writes it. The victorious Christian life is a series of new beginnings. For Jonah, this was indeed a new beginning. The word of the Lord came to him a second time. And this is what God said. Psalm 130, I'll I'll jump to this psalm before we get to Jonah 3 again. There is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. And the fear comes from the fact that with sin, there are consequences. And so again, the word of the Lord comes to Jonah a second time, and this is what the word said. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. And now Nineveh was a very large city, and it took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going through a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, and here's the message from God, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. And that last sentence there is really key. It's important for someone to to believe you. It's important, you know, for you to believe each other. It's important for maybe you to believe even some of the things I'm saying. But inevitably, there won't be transformation and change in your heart until you believe God, until they believe God because that's where the faith will come in. That's where God's Holy Spirit transforms. And maybe some of, the, some of the struggle that you're having with connecting with somebody you're trying to help, I'm sure you're trying to help some people, is that you're trying to get them to believe you, and maybe there just needs to be this shift to where you need to say, you know, I need to get this person to believe God. And so that's what Jonah goes into the city proclaiming this message, and then the people believe him. 40 days. Why is it that there were 40 days In the Bible, 40 is often associated with testing and judgment. For example here, Noah's family was on the ark 40 days as the world was being judged. The Israelite spies were in Canaan for 40 days as they were performing reconnaissance and deciding whether or not they would go in and attempt to take the land. The Israelites were tested in the wilderness for 40 years. Goliath taunted the army of Israel for 40 days as he was testing them. Nineveh was given 40 days then to repent. There were 40 days. God, if he wanted to judge them, he could have done it right then and there. But that's not God's way. Instead, God is willing to give us time. And this is the truth. 
that we need to hang on to here is God will give you time to believe in him. That he's willing to give you an opportunity to come around to him. That you don't necessarily have to accept it all at once. Like there's a, there's a, a season in which we got to allow the truth to sink in. And we need to allow it to sink in for other people. I like how Second Peter puts it. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you. He was patient with Nineveh. He was patient with many others. He's patient with me, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. There are many that would have liked, especially in Israel, that would have liked Nineveh to be destroyed that very second that God came to Jonah. But God is, doesn't work that way. He's patient, doesn't want anyone to perish. If you think back to John chapter 3, one of the most, the most famous Bible verse in all of probably all of the world, is for God so loved the world that who shall ever believe in him will not perish, but have eternal life. That who sh- and there's a few little words there I'm leaving out. But the idea is, is that he doesn't want anyone to perish. He's given you time to come to him with repentance. This past week, I was sharing with some of you who were here that I'd like you to write a rescue psalm. We, we looked at Jonah chapter 2, which is essentially Jonah's rescue psalm, a story of, Jonah bring, of God bringing Jonah up out of the pit, out of the belly of the fish. And I received some of them, a few from you. This is one rescue psalm that I have that I'd like to share with you. It's a little lengthy, but I, I think it, it serves this point well. And it's of a woman who dealt with a hard childhood, who had many people in her life pointing her back to the Lord, but she wasn't ready to go back to God because... Well, she was dealing with a lot of pain and hurt. And this was her story that she wrote. It's in poem form. When I was a child, I didn't know you, but I heard your name and I called on you. You must not have heard because the hurt and pain continued. When I was a teen, I didn't know you, but I heard your name and I called on you. You must not have heard because the hurt and pain continued. When I was a young adult, I thought you were just this made-up person. You, who people said loved me, If you were real, you would have never let this happen. But I called your name again. You must not have heard because the hurt and pain continued. When I felt alone, degraded, worthless, and in love, I again called on you to end my life. I had reached the end. I no longer wanted to endure the hurt and pain. You must not have heard because I am still here. When I had reached my lowest, I called on you again and again. That's when I looked around and knew it wasn't you that didn't hear me, but I that didn't hear you. That's when I knew. When I was a child, you were there because I'm still here. When I was a teenager, you were there because I'm still here. When I was a young adult, you were there because I'm still here. When I wanted to end my life, you were there because I'm still here. When I felt worthless and unloved, you were there because I'm still here. When I had reached my lowest, you were there because I'm still here. So now I call on you every day when I don't hear you or feel you. I see you in everything, my family, my friends, my church, the beauty of earth. And it took her some time to come around to believing. But God is a God who's willing to give us time to come around to believing. And fortunately, hopefully along the way, we come around sooner than later. Because the longer we take, the more consequences that we end up having to deal with along the way. But God is willing to give us time. And he gave them, the Ninevites, time. And so the word came to the king of what was going on and what was being said from Jonah. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let the people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. The king doesn't know what God is going to do. He just believes the message that he's been given. You know, the thing, some of you are control freaks. And so you kind of struggle with these two words, who knows what's going to happen, because you want to know everything that's going to happen. And you aren't going to move forward until you know what exactly is going to happen. And I love control freaks because you are, you're readily able to admit you have a control issue. Now, you never change, but you're, you're willing to at least say, I have this control issue. 
But you have to let it go at some point. Faith calls us all to let it go at some point. Those moments when we have to move forward and just say, who knows what God's going to do? Who knows what's going to happen if I tell a friend of mine about Jesus and how he has helped me through my struggles and how he could help them through their struggles? Who knows what God will do with that? Who knows what would happen if I, maybe this is you here today. You're like, maybe if I started attending a church regularly, like what would God do in my life? Like that was, that was like, I mean, obviously the most important decision I made was to believe in Jesus, but leading up to that decision, that was a pretty significant decision for me to make to start attending. Who know? I would have never dreamed that God would take me to this place, but that, but who knows what God will do if you just begin to start making that decision? Who knows what God would do if you broke off that relationship? Who knows what God would do if you began to budget your money? Who knows what God could do with those things if you started being generous? Who knows what God would do if you decided to believe in Jesus? Who knows what could be changed? There's a story in the Old Testament that also uses this phrase, who knows? It's found in the story of Esther. And it's there that Esther essentially wins a beauty pageant. That's what happens. She's the prettiest girl in the kingdom. And so she's this Israelite girl that gets to become the queen of Persia because of that. There's a man named Haman who doesn't like the Jews. He tricks the king into an issue and a decree that will have all of the Jews executed. Esther's cousin Mordecai catches word of this decree. He sends word to Esther and he tells her this. This is what happens. When Esther's words were reported, he, he tells he sends word to Esther, and then Esther sends back word to him that she can't go to the king. And when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. In other words, Esther, you're going to die. God's will will ultimately prevail, but you're going to die. You won't make it through if you don't step up in this situation. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family, you will perish. God's got a plan for us. We're going to make it. The people of Israel will eventually make it. There's always going to be a remnant, but you're not going to live. But then he goes in, who knows? Who knows that you've been put here for such, in this royal position for such a time as this? Who knows how God might use you? And what ended up happening? She began to pray. She called for a fast amongst all the Jewish people. And then she went to the king And in that moment, she was given grace. She was given mercy. The king didn't, the king had the right to take her life. She wasn't allowed to go into the king's presence, but he gave her mercy in that moment. God seemingly softened his heart. The Jewish people were then saved because she was willing to enter into that who knows type of moment where only God can work. And so what happens with the people of Nineveh? They pray, they repent. Verse 3. 10 of chapter 3 says, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened them. Some of you have said, what good is it to pray? Some of you have said, if God is going to do what God is going to do, why should I even pray? Why, Why should I try to give this over to the Lord if God's just going to do whatever it is that God's going to do? This is a great example of how our prayers And how even turning from our certain behaviors in our lives can influence God. Here's the point. God is influenced by your prayers and repentance. This is how it works. God doesn't change. Okay, so let's just be clear on that. If God could change, become more or less, then he wouldn't be God. He's God. He's he's set. He is who he is. That's just the way it goes. God doesn't change. But circumstances and situations, and we do change. And this is really, this is so important when it comes to prayer. This will change the way you pray if you really believe this. When you pray, you are changing one of the variables in the equation. When you repent, you're changing one of those other variables that are maybe maybe leading down a path of some sort of destructive path that God is going to have to bring discipline into. Let's look at it like this. It's like a formula. This was Nineveh. Violence plus disbelief was going to equal God's destruction. There are a lot of other variables, but these were the two critical ones. They changed. Repentance plus prayer equal God relenting. God doesn't change. But when you pray, it changes the situation. That's why in the Old Testament, when God said to Moses, I'm going to destroy them, Moses pleaded for them. And God relented. 
There are multiple instances in which God tells Jeremiah not to pray because God wants to bring about some sort of destruction or God wanted to discipline the people, but Jeremiah prayed anyway and God relented. Your prayers make a difference. I have a friend of mine who I was speaking with yesterday. He's in an incredible place in life right now. He's uh, leading up this basketball training clinics in Southern Indiana. He's at capacity. The only thing slowing down his business from growing is, is employees. He's trying to find good employees. He's got a website that's getting 5,000 hits a day and he hasn't even really done much to promote it. 15 years ago, you wouldn't have believed that he's where he is now. 15 years ago, you wouldn't believe that people would be trusting him with their kids. Because 15 years ago, he made some pretty, some really significant mistakes in his life. But he finally turned his life around because he finally turned his life over to God. And he will tell you that, that he had spent years running from God. And it was about five years ago that he really hit bottom. And those mistakes that he had made so many years prior to even that, they finally caught up to him. He wasn't getting ahead. He was dealing with the consequences and the outcomes of those bad decisions. And he finally repented. He finally turned into his faith and went down the path that God had him down. And it's amazing to see what has happened as a result of that. It didn't happen overnight, but it has started to happen. And some of you need to hear that. Like, you need to get back on the right track. You need to he start heading down the path that God wants you to head down. It won't change everything overnight. But over time, there's going to be this compound effect and you're going to look back five years from, from that moment of obedience, that moment of decisiveness. And you'll look back and say, look at how far God has brought me. Look at all the things that have happened. Who would have ever knew? Who knows? Who knows what will happen if you really were to turn to the Lord and go down his path and, and in prayer seek him out. You allow the truth that's been getting spoken to you for so long to finally seek in and believe it. And you'll quit letting the shame and the guilt get the best of you and weigh you down and believe that God is truly a God of second chances, third chances, fourth chances, fifth chances, on and on and on we go. Because no matter how bad you might be, you are no match for his mercy. Life, quit trying to align yourself with life. It'll never give you a do-over. But God's ready to give you a start over. So get on the path that he has for you. Let's have a word of prayer. And then we will uh, continue in our service and our worship. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your Son. We're grateful for the grace that's possible in Him. Lord, wherever we are at right now, Father, help us to get on path with you if we're off track. Lord, if we know people in our lives who may be heading down the wrong path, help us to know how to come alongside them and encourage them along. Lord, we need you to intersect into our lives just now. In Jesus' name, amen.